Here on BBC One in half an hour, a challenging time for Dr Claire Maitland in cardiac arrest. Now the nine o'clock news with Michael Burke. Twelve people have died in a plane crash in Yorkshire tonight. The commuter aircraft came down in a thunderstorm shortly after taking off from Leeds Bradford Airport. A day of tributes to Lord Wilson, the most successful British politician since Gladstone. And England's amateur rugby players look set to earn £30,000 a season. Good evening. All 12 people on board a small twin-engine commuter plane have died tonight when it crashed in a thunderstorm just north of Leeds. It came down in a tree-lined valley. There was a crew of three and nine passengers who were thought to be mostly businessmen. The plane was on a scheduled weekday flight that had just left Leeds Bradford Airport for Aberdeen, operated by a company called Night Air. The pilot radioed for permission to return to the airfield, but seconds later it crashed near the village of Harewood. This is the debris of flight NE816, scattered across a cornfield six miles northeast of the airport it had just left. There were nine passengers and three crew members on the small twin-engine commuter plane. Three minutes after takeoff at quarter to six this evening, the pilot had radioed back his distress signal and requested to return to the airport. Five minutes later, the aircraft disappeared from radar screens. Within minutes, the emergency services received their first call. A spokesman for the owners of the aircraft a few minutes ago explained what happened. A night air under anti-aircraft took off from Leeds Bradford Airport, bound for Aberdeen. Shortly after departure, the pilot requested a return to the airport. The aircraft was being observed on radar, and at 17.50 it disappeared from the air traffic controller's screens. There were 12 persons on board the aircraft, North Yorkshire Police have confirmed that there is an aircraft accident site near Harewood Bridge, six miles northeast of the airport. We are working closely with North Yorkshire Constabulary, who are in charge of the accident scene. We have no further details yet. At this stage, it is too early to comment about what may have caused the incident that the Civil Aviation Authority and the Air Accident Investigation Branch are en route to the scene and will conduct a full inquiry. We are, of course, all devastated at this tragic news and our heartfelt sympathy goes out to all those concerned. No other aircraft was involved, but eyewitnesses say rain and thunder meant visibility was very poor. As a fleet of ambulances arrived, firefighters sent in cutting and heavy lifting equipment. The initial action was obviously to put out any fire that was involved. The wreckage was spread over a considerable area and their immediate action would be to search for casualties. Uh, they are still searching the area and will continue to do so until all casualties uh, have been located. No, we just heard a large bang which sounded like um, light, well, thunder. Um, and we thought it was thunder actually because we've just had a heavy rainfall here and um, then we heard all the emergency vehicles um, passing and gathered that there'd been a bad accident and um, we've only just realised that through listening to on the radio that it is a light aircraft and that some people have been killed. The plane was heading for Aberdeen Airport. The Civil Aviation Authority say it was a Brazilian-made Embraer Bandarati, an EMB 110. It's likely nearly all those on board were businessmen or women travelling to Aberdeen. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News. Well, I'm joined now by our aviation correspondent, Chris Wayne. Chris, we've just heard that the weather was bad, thunderstorms, fog. What are the guidelines for an aircraft of this kind to take off in that kind well, of weather? Well, obviously, uh, the captain of an aircraft has complete responsibility for the safety of his aircraft and his passengers. He will get a Met report, he will look at the weather. If it was impossibly bad, clearly he wouldn't take off, but this sounds as though it was fairly ordinary weather conditions, bit of rumbling thunder, a rain squall. squall. He decided that he would fly off. He wouldn't fly through the heart of the storm. He fly around it. But, but could a thunderstorm by itself cause this kind of crash or just would. merely make other things more difficult? I would think it would make anything else more difficult from the sound of it he, when he decided to come back. That certainly indicates some kind of problem. My guess would be that there'd been some kind of power loss, possibly something with an engine. The reason being that he disappeared from radar, so he was losing height fairly close to the airfield. 
obviously it means that he was trying to get back possibly on only one engine. A Brazilian commuter aircraft, what do we know about its safety record? Bandeirante is an excellent aircraft, there are hundreds of them in use all over the world, it's got Canadian built Pratt & Whitney engines, very good safety record, a fine aircraft. Briefly, what sort of investigation there to find out the cause of Full it? Full investigation now by the Air Accident Investigation Branch, by the Canadians also, and by the Brazilians. They will all be coming over to see if there's anything other than just a, a straightforward crash. Chris Wayne, thanks very much indeed. An emergency telephone line has been set up for anyone worried they might have relatives on board the flight. The number is 0113 That's 0113 And we'll bring you more information on that crash when we get it. Friends and old political foes of Lord Wilson have been paying tribute to him today after he died during the night in his sleep. He'd been ill for many years. He was 79. As Harold Wilson, he led Labour to four election victories in the 60s and 70s, more than any political leader since Gladstone. Two of those who in Harold Wilson's heyday were at the centre of power leave after tributes in the House of Lords. His widow, Lady Wilson, getting into the car, and Lady Falconder, or Marcia Williams, as she was known when she headed his private office. The 60s is now seen by Labour as a land of hope and opportunity, and the way their leaders then managed to overturn 13 years of Tory rule is held up by Mr Blair as just the sort of example he wants to pursue. The tributes in the Commons were led by the Prime Minister. A man of many achievements. And above all, perhaps, a very human man who served his country well and honourably and has earned by that a secure place in its history. Harold Wilson, in a sense, was to politics what the Beatles were to popular culture. He simply dominated the nation's political landscape. And he personified the new era. Not stuffy or hidebound, but classless, forward-looking, modern. Harold Wilson, the master of the political image, never hid his ambition to reach number 10. Indeed, he liked to foster the impression that he'd been thinking about it for most of his life. He became leader in 1963, and he quickly made change sound like Labour's ally. The Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated methods on either side of industry. He was the first real television prime minister, playing to the gallery and chasing the votes. But Edward Heath managed to beat him in 1970. And this afternoon, in a message to Lord Wilson's family, Sir Edward paid him a generous tribute. They too know that his achievements are recognised by this house and, with help from the historians, will be recognised in due course by the country and by the rest of the world. This country owes a great deal to him. We are grateful. Many still have strong memories of him, and some paid tribute at Labour headquarters. For most of the past 15 years, illness kept Lord Wilson out of the public eye. But among present Labour leaders, his stock remains high. Well, I think uh, many of us remember Harold Wilson as the man who brought us into politics, who inspired the generation of the 1960s who symbolized change, dynamism and modernization at that time. A very good Prime Minister, a man who was close to the people and won four elections. That's a very good precedent for us. For a former top-class academic, one of his skills was to appear ordinary. He was genuinely popular, though it was something he had to work at. Thank you very much for giving us this silver heart. But I still think you should, should have given one to good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> His flair for publicity, he was the greatest news editor that never was, came into play in foreign affairs. He used British warships for meetings with the recalcitrant Rhodesian leader Ian Smith. But he couldn't contain the white rebellion in Africa. Mr Smith accepted today it wasn't possible. I was sorry that we didn't succeed in arriving at a solution. But that was the, the politics of the time, the international politics. Harold Wilson retired as Prime Minister to public surprise at 60. Labour stayed in power for another three years. He told close friends about his intention, and looking back, he insisted there was no mystery behind it. Well, I, I wanted to give a few, a few chaps a chance, uh, because 
uh, as you know, 75 minutes just went on a very, very long time. 60th birthday for me. Today, his own flag, which used to fly whenever he travelled on the ferry to his home in the Scilly Isles, was at half-mast. For Lord Wilson, the patriot who loved to put on a bit of a show, it was the sort of touch he would have liked. John Sargent, BBC News. Harold Wilson brought Labour to power after 13 years of Conservative government and went on to claim that his had become the natural party of government. But historians are divided about how much his time as Prime Minister changed the Labour Party. Our political correspondent Steve Richards assesses the legacy of the Wilson years. Harold Wilson won four elections, leading what he called a broad church. Was it an achievement to keep cabinet and party together, or a failing not to tackle divisions which would later tear the party apart? A party of ideological protest wasn't his priority. He wanted to govern. After spending the greater part of our 75 years of history in opposition, from being the party of protest, we have now become the natural party of government in this country. All those in favour, please show. And in the face of dissent, that meant compromise, recognising, as in his bid to curb trade union powers in place of strife, that if a policy can't get through Cabinet, with ministers like Jim Callaghan backing trade unionists, you can see defeat. It was a, as divisive an issue as, I suppose, the, um, the problem of Europe has been with the Conservatives in recent years. But on Europe, Wilson's skills of party management were tested too. He was for joining the common market for some of the 60s, negotiating with the French at one point, but became anti in the early 70s. A grave error, according to some. I think Harold Wilson could have played a better hand in the 1970s. I don't think it was an easy position for him. But I think had he stuck to his new apparent position, which he'd taken up very strongly in the last few years of the life of the 64 to 70 government, and then he would have increased his reputation in the country. A referendum on Britain's continuing membership in 1975 was Wilson's device for keeping cabinet and party together. It was an object lesson in effective pragmatism for an anti-marketeer soon to discover the strains of leadership. He was the person who, more than anybody else, kept the party together on the subject of the common market so that we were enabled to fight again another day. The economic background for much of Wilson's period in power didn't help bind the party together. The pound's devaluation in 1967 wasn't enhanced by attempts to reassure. From now on, the pound abroad is worth 14% or so less in terms of other currencies. That doesn't mean, of course, that the pound here in Britain, in your pocket or purse or in your bank, has been devalued. He dealt with leadership speculation arising from economic difficulties and policy differences in the late 60s bluntly. I know what is going on. <laughs> I am going on. But Wilson's achievements go beyond surviving amidst warring colleagues. There were important advances, including the open university. But the challenge of uniting a cabinet can be seen from the differing assessments of two former cabinet members. The Labour Party is like a bird. It can't fly without a left wing. Harold worked for the left. And he had Tories in his cabinet, you see, uh, and socialists. And to uh, w uh, bring everybody together is quite difficult, but he did work with the left, and that was the difference between him and any subsequent Labour leader. I don't think he was a great leader on a level, say, with Attlee and Jim Callaghan, partly because I don't think he had a very powerful sense of direction, and he was extraordinarily over-optimistic about the situation, what I used to call the Walter Mitty factor. It's Wilson's early years in opposition, prior to the 1964 victory on which there is consensus. He captured the mood of the times, visiting the cabin in Liverpool with cameras in tow. New look Labour, if not new Labour. And it's this period that Tony Blair has focused on to some extent, praising Wilson's ability to popularise complex issues. But Michael Foote, 19 years after Wilson's first victory, led a deeply divided party to a massive defeat. Some, though not Foote himself, say Wilson was partly responsible. It's an ironic charge, as Wilson, for one, saw the maintenance of party unity as his big achievement. I hope I'll be remembered as one who, in the face of the biggest challenges, above all economic problems the country has faced in its history, kept the party together, kept the country together, kept the country united, secured a common 
effort from the people and an acceptance of the sacrifices that had to be made. I wish I could have been Prime Minister in happier times and easier times. After Lord Wilson's retirement, politics moved into more ideological territory, but his own assessment of his achievements is coming more into fashion again as politics returns to a more pragmatic era. Steve Richards, BBC News, Westminster. And there'll be a special programme on the life and legacy of Harold Wilson later tonight at 10 o'clock on BBC One. The United Nations commander in Bosnia tonight threatened both the Bosnian Serbs and the Bosnian government with airstrikes unless they observe a ceasefire. The ultimatum came after five people died during heavy fighting in Sarajevo. A UN logistics base was hit by a rocket causing extensive damage. The UN ultimatum followed a violent day here. The Serbs knew what was coming. They seized three heavy weapons from UN control early today and pounded Bosnian government positions. The landscape here was being rearranged by the Serbs' heavy guns. Down below, civilians were taking what cover they could find. John Jordan wasn't. The head of the UN's frontline fire service was in town to plead against budget cuts. Medieval rules, World War I tactics and 1950s technology. You know, that's what this gig is, you know. Are you going to quit or we'll hang in here? Well, it's not a matter of quitting. We're out of, we're going to, we're out of budget. For the second time in five years. It started out of a clear blue, but with some sign it may have been pre-planned and premeditated this time. The target for the government forces is Serbian frontline position in the south of the city, and the Serbs are retaliating on targets in the city itself. And it escalated. The municipality accused the Serbs of using phosphorus against a populated area. The UN confirmed this was a tank round with phosphorus. Those are the little pieces of white phosphorus, which, from which, in contact with the air, the smoke starts to billow. But if those pieces of phosphorus actually hit skin, they burn. But most of the damage was done by mortars which were fired into both sides of town. On the government side, four people were killed and 20 injured, including a 20-month-old girl. The government called for NATO airstrikes without expecting them. I wonder what reaction would be if they throw some kind of a nuclear device here. I'm sure even then the UN will find an excuse not to do anything. All day each side pounded the other with heavy weapons which they were supposed not to have in the Sarajevo area. By tonight the UN had had enough and General Smith issued his ultimatum. In view of these grave circumstances and with the intent of stabilizing the situation, all heavy weapons as previously defined, are to cease firing and the four heavy weapons removed from the Osiak and Polinia uh, weapon collection points are to be returned by 1200 hours local Thursday 25th of May 1995. And by midday on Friday he said all heavy weapons must be under UN control. Failure to comply with either deadline will result in the offending party or parties being attacked from the air. The UN itself is in danger. This was the damage done to one of its bases in Sarajevo by rocket fire late today. Tomorrow will decide what kind of a future it has here. Martin Bell, BBC News, Sarajevo. The mother of the six-year-old Peterborough schoolboy, Ricky Neve, has tonight been charged with his murder. She'll appear at Peterborough Magistrates Court tomorrow. Ricky's naked body was discovered last November near his home. He'd been strangled. In February, his mother, Ruth Neve, led mourners at a memorial service for her son. Labour's National Executive Committee has approved the process of imposing women-only shortlists for the selection of some parliamentary candidates. The NEC sanctioned the imposition of the policy on one constituency in the South West as a signal to other areas that they should follow suit. The Manchester United and England footballer Paul Ince has been found not guilty of assaulting a fan during a game against Crystal Palace in January. Croydon Magistrates Court also cleared him of using threatening behaviour against other Palace supporters at the match. The driver of the coach which crashed on the M4 yesterday, killing ten passengers, has told police he swerved to avoid an object on the carriageway. Ten of those injured are still in hospital. Two are in a critical condition. The coach was carrying a Royal British Legion party back to Christchurch in Dorset after a trip to Cardiff. Throughout the day, tributes have been arriving at the Royal British Legion headquarters in Christchurch. Among them, flowers from a representative of the Avon Fire Brigade, which was involved in yesterday's rescue operation. One of the luckier survivors, meanwhile, recounted his ordeal. 
Alan Martin, who'd been asleep when hurled across the coach during the crash, said despite the horror, there was no panic. There was a almost total silence. Um, I didn't hear any screaming or shouting whatsoever. Um, just calling to one another. As the investigation goes on into what caused the crash on the M4 near Bristol, the driver, who also survived with minor injuries, has been giving his version to the police. He's told them he swerved to avoid an obstacle in the road, but what, the police still don't know. At this stage, I don't want to speculate on that. As you appreciate, um, we have to carry out a detailed uh, investigation into it. That investigation may rule out mechanical failure as a result. But the tragedy has reopened the debate about coach safety and the inevitable questions about whether seat belts would have saved lives. Lap belts are already standard in many new coaches, which are now required to have anti-roll bars. The accident has also raised questions about the effectiveness of crash barriers. This new concrete version, capable of stopping a heavy goods vehicle, is being tested at vulnerable locations on the M25. For the people of Christchurch who this evening arrived at the Royal British Legion for a private service for the bereaved families, these are important questions. But for the moment, they're more concerned to mourn the loss of their friends. Grief, concern and shock that such a thing could happen in 